Our guests for today's podcast are two young, driven, but formidable individuals within the motorsports world. Continuing the lineage of Brazil's rich racing history, they have forged a lane of their own as they have grinded along their respective journeys through the FIA circuit system. More than competitors, more than elite athletes, these individuals are brothers, tied to a bond beyond their passion for driving. The eldest has been blessed with the opportunity to experience Formula One's brightest lights and tenacious competition, while the younger of the two has been relentlessly climbing the ladder and is on the cusp of breaking through Formula Two for the opportunity to compete on the grandest stage of them all. Please welcome to the show, Pietro and Enzo Fittipaldi. Thank you, guys. How's everything going? Thank you, man. Everything, <laughs> I really, everything. I really, I really appreciate. I really appreciate the invite. It's an honor to be here uh, doing this podcast with you guys. Uh, me and my brother were very happy uh, to be taking part. Yeah, I like I like the presentation. You presented us very well. <laughs> oh man, let's, let's, we, we do the research. It's all about like giving you guys the flowers, giving you guys the love, man. I Look at these two. How can you not love these two? So <laughs> offline, I was like, where are you guys at right now? You know, they're they're locked down in Prague right now. That's their home base. And I'm just like, geez, you know, you got the you got the Brazil flag, got the Bank of Brazil in the background. You're sitting at the at the racing simulator. So just tell me what life has been like for you guys. Uh, obviously, in two different journeys. We'll start with actually you, Pietro. And just tell us what you've been up to recently and how everything's looking. Yeah, so we moved to um, to Czech Republic beginning of the year, and uh, basically I've been living here with Enzo because his team, his Formula Two team, uh, is like 20 minutes from where we live, and uh, it's been good. I've been following the Formula One calendar with Haas as reserve driver, so I'm going to all the Formula One races. The good thing about that is I'm able to follow my brother's races as well because every time he races, he's um, he's uh, with Formula One, so we're you know same race weekend, same track, so. I'm there with Haas, and at the same time, I'm able to follow what he's doing. And uh, and I'm as well, I've been uh, sports car racing, so doing a lot of endurance racing, European Le Mans, 24 hours of Le Mans, which I raced in July. That was uh, incredible. And uh, kind of now towards the end of the season, already working on things for, for next year and trying to get all the deals done to um, to be racing something even better next season. So we'll see what the, what the future holds. Awesome. Awesome. What about you, Enzo? So basically, yeah, I'm, I'm currently racing in uh, Formula Two. Uh, and the reason we're living in Prague is because my team is uh, only 30 minutes from, uh, from here. So I basically moved here uh, last year when I started racing with them in, in Formula Three. Um, and then I moved up to Formula Two with them. And my brother's living here with me. And it's, it's been amazing. You know, we, we would train a lot on the simulator here. We work together. Um, and it's just been an amazing journey up until now. Uh, you know, my goal is to make it to Formula One this year in Formula Two. It's my rookie season. Um, I've had six podiums up until now. And now we're, you know, we're fighting for the top three in the championship, uh, which is amazing. So there's one round left in uh, Abu Dhabi in about uh, two months from now. Um, so there's kind of going to be like the finale, uh, the fight for the top three in the championship. And it's been an amazing uh, uh, season uh, up until now. That's awesome. So what, what team are you actually a part of? So my team is uh, Sharu's Racing System. Uh, they're a Czech team. My brother raced uh, with them and won the championship with them in 2017 uh, in World Series, which they used to be called Lotus uh, Racing Team. Um, and then in 2018, they changed their name to Sharus, uh, and they started racing in Formula Two. So it's a team that I've known for a really long time. I think I've known the team manager and team owner for over eight years now, uh, because you know my brother has uh, you know a big history with them, and um, yeah, it's amazing to to be working with a team that we know so um, so well. That's awesome. I know Milad wants to kind of get into that family history a little bit. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, man. Um, I think the best place to start, and you know, this is becoming more of like a staple for us before we dive into the family, before we dive into the history, before we talk about what it takes to be a driver at that level. Um, you know, you, you guys have known Devin for a while, you know, his run your own race mantra. You know, what does that mean to you in your own words? 
No, I think for me, um, you know, run your own race. I actually, I met Devin uh, when he was recovering from his injury in the, the Indy 500. That was last year. So it's crazy how far you've, uh, you've come, man. I mean, I remember you there in crutches and now you're, you're in the NBA. So, I mean, you, you came back to the NBA. So it's something uh, amazing to see. I actually have a very similar story in a way where the year after I won the championship for the team that Enzo's racing for now, that was, uh, I won the championship in 2017. And then I had many opportunities in 2018 and like things were kind of, you know, taking off for me. And, um, and unfortunately middle of the season, actually it was kind of like beginning of the season car had a failure, boom, hit the wall. And I, I broke both my legs, had compound fractures. And, um, the doctor said, you know, you won't be back racing until, you know, next season. So you have to wait a year. And, uh, I kind of had that, you know, similar run your own race uh but you know in the racing style where i was like man i can't miss the opportunities i have now I have contracts with teams and what what ends up happening is the team will put another driver so the contract you have with them at the end uh it goes to nothing and they put another driver and then you know the following season you might not have an opportunity anymore so i was like i have to find a way to get back to the seat um and i i i did that i went to indianapolis um did all my rehab, which, you know, we can talk about the process later on, but basically that's kind of my run your own race story was doctor said, you'll be back in a year. And I was able to get back in the car in two months. And from those results that I had in those final races remaining, um, I got my chance in, in formula one. It's amazing, man. It's so special. I, and yeah, we definitely will tap into that a little later. <laughs> so thanks for sharing. Enzo, what about you? When you hear run your own race, you know, if you had to define it, if you had to kind of like talk about how you run your own race, how would you define it to your audience? Yeah. So I think very similar to, to how my, uh, you know, my brother said it and, uh, you know, it was great meeting, uh, Devin and, uh, we met each other at the 500. Um, and it was when Devin was also, you know, he was in his crutches. It was the same time my brother and I, we, we met Devin and, uh, you know, Devin was going through a really difficult time, uh, at that moment. And, uh, like my brother said, he, you know, he had to take a time off the NBA. He recovered and made it back to the NBA. And I kind of have a, a similar story. Uh, but in, in Formula 2, you know, I had a really big accident um, at the end of last year uh, at a track called Jetta. You know, it was a, a crash um, at the start. Um, and I remember, you know, it was, a, it was a really big crash. I smashed my heel and then I had some, um, you know, some issues with the brain bleeding and everything. And I had to do some, uh, some surgeries. And, uh, luckily I, you know, I put my, my full focus on, uh, you know, after the crash, I had two months, uh, to get ready for the next season. And the doctors said, you know, it's going to be basically impossible for you to be ready for the first uh, round, which was, uh, in March in Bahrain. And, you know, basically just, you know, run your own risk, do your thing, focus on your, on what you have to do uh, to get back to where you want to get to. And that's what I did. I just put my full focus and energy in healing as fast as possible in everything I can do, uh, you know, to be back as soon as possible. And that was training every day, uh, you know, many times per day, uh, even with the, you know, the cast physical on therapy, my right leg, we're doing physical therapy training my, the rest of my body that I could train, uh, you know, to get blood flow to the broken bones, which would then help uh, heal faster. Um, and that was, you know, all through January, all through February. And, you know, I was ready uh, to race in the first race of Bahrain, which was very close that I didn't make it to the start of the season. Uh, and I was going to probably be out for the whole season. And, uh, you know, I put my focus to it and I made it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's crazy how much how much there are similarities in all of our stories when it comes to the injury component, you know, and, and I had the Indy 500 was my first time being at any sort of racing event. I'm from Indiana. I grew up there and <laughs> had never been to the Indy 500. And it's just funny that the way I got there was through your uncle, Max Pappas, Max Poppies and and I, I I make fun of his voice and how he talks and his like <laughs> yeah <laughs> his like, Italian style. <laughs> David, come on over. We can bring you to the race. You know? 
and, but he's a great dude. I love him. Uh, obviously, Mateo, Marco, his, his wife, you know, so um, they're a great family. I'm glad we got to meet. Um, but obviously, our relationship with with injuries and with trying to come back and get to the highest level. I mean, we're going to talk about Formula One. I, I'm not the expert. You guys are the expert. I have my little racing system here that you guys have inspired me to get. And I'm, I'm obviously playing the F1, F2 game, which Enzo's on. We'll, we'll pull up a little clip of him driving in the video game. But no, man, um, it's really crazy that, you know, people who, who go through these injuries, who go through setbacks, and it may not be physically, maybe mentally, spiritually. Uh, when someone tells you you can't do something, when someone sets a timeline on your race, on your journey, um, and there's these real factors at play, getting a contract, getting a seat, being ready for season, me getting back to the NBA, you, you, you have no limitations in what you say for yourself, right? And we've all seen from myself, Enzo P, you know, coming back and being successful. So, man, it's, it's good to have you guys on. Thanks, Devin. It's amazing. Like I said, it's amazing to be here and all the similarities. Uh, yeah, all the similarities the, is, is recovering incredible. and then getting back and then doing well. It's uh, it, it's not easy. It's a it's a journey for sure. It's a big journey, but you do come out always. with that for me, uh, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys. You come out a stronger person mentally, uh, physically, and uh, yeah, I think it, it, it's a it's a, it is a, a difficult time in your life, but at the end, I think uh, you come out stronger. And it's a it's an experience where you learn a lot from it as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So let's take it back to like the very beginning for a second. You know, I think a lot of people watch F1. They love F1 specifically now, right now in America. Uh, but they don't actually know where that journey begins, where that race begins. You know, people may think that there's a F1, F2, F3, F4. But what's like the actual inception? Like, how do you get to a point where you're in juniors? in F4, in F3, et cetera, right? Where does it all start? And how did it start yeah. for you? So basically, um, you know, I think you have to start in, uh, you have to start in karting, right? So that's uh, really where you learn the basics and the, the principles. That's how we started. So we lived in Florida. We were actually born in Miami. And uh, there was a track near uh, Opalaka, um, which uh, it's actually, yeah. It, it, All right, Milad. Milad's going to be at the yeah. race. After this, he's going to be there. He's getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Florida has a bunch of uh, karting tracks and um, it's very competitive in Florida. So we started there. I was uh, four years old when I got my first kart. I started going, you know, like once every two months. Um, started going then once a month, once a week, and then twice a week, three times a week. Then when I was around six, seven, I started competing. And, um, and it went on from there. And I think Enzo, yeah, you started when you were four as well, right? Yeah, I started, yeah, when I was four years old and, uh, at Opaloka and I, uh, you know, I kind of uh, followed my brother's footsteps cause he is, uh, was older than me. And I was just, uh, you know, since I was a little baby, I would go watch his races. Um, and yeah, I just followed his footsteps and, uh, yeah, we started, we would train at the same place and I would, you know, my brother would go moving up the categories and then I would take over his go-kart and then he would get a bigger go-kart. So <laughs> that's how it's kind of worked. Enzo would get the scraps. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, so basically, yeah, you start with the karting and uh, I went kind of the unconventional way. Uh, usually from karting, you would go to like Formula 4, which is the first uh, race car that you drive. From Formula 4, you would do one to two seasons. You then progress to Formula 3, Formula 2. And then, obviously, if you're good enough and you're winning, then you're you're able to get to Formula 1. But I didn't have – everything in racing uh, depends on funding because, uh, unfortunately, it's very expensive to run the cars uh, and you need sponsors and backing behind to be able to advance to, you know, every series. Every series has a certain budget. When you move up, the budget's bigger and it keeps going until you get to Formula 1. So – you need to have the backing behind to be able to do it. When I went from karting to cars, we didn't have the, the money to go race in Europe and do Formula 4, for example. So I started racing NASCAR. And that's when my family moved to North Carolina because I started doing very well over there. And this was oval racing. So completely different style of racing to what Formula 1 is. I won the championship there. And then when I won that championship in NASCAR, I got recognized um, by uh, Carlos Slim. Um who was a main investor in my career. 
And uh, he basically said, Pietro, I want to fund your career, and but I want to take you to Europe. And I said, you know, for sure, I want to give it a shot. So and that's when he went. I, I moved to England when I was 16. And oh. that's when I started doing the British Formula 4. And then it kind of went on from there. And Enzo went straight from karting to um, to to Europe. He didn't do the NASCAR thing that I no, did. No, I did. I did, actually. Oh, yeah, you did a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I did there. one year, one, two years of Bandoleros and one year of little NASCARs. Yeah, yeah. And right. I won the championship in uh, Bandoleros yeah. and in Charlotte. So has a little NASCAR in his blood, too. I did uh, the oval racing with the Bandoleros and Legends. And, you know, you learn a lot from that. Because, you know, like I said, I would just follow my brother's footsteps. And everything my brother went to nascar and i would he was doing late models and then i was doing the series below late models which was at the time bandoleros and then legends um and then when my brother went to europe uh you know my eyes went to europe my focus also uh went to europe and um i went on from there and went on from there yeah so you know you guys mentioned especially you enzo you mentioned that you know your what your brother did you felt compelled to do. Obviously, you guys come from a you know a family with rich roots. You know, not to mention you know granddad Emerson, uh, your cousin Christian. I mean, that the list really does go on with you guys uh, in terms of family members. What was what was it like growing up in that household? Did you feel like a a, a pressure or or a need to want to do racing, or did it come more naturally? Was it just something you naturally gravitated towards? Uh, for me, it was very natural. I mean, I really, ever since a young age, that's, it's difficult to know, like, you know, for me, all I knew was uh, racing, you know, that's basically what we grew up into. So for me, it was normal um, to be, you know, going to the go-kart every day to go train and uh, to go watch my brother racing in the weekend, uh, because we just grew up into it. And it was something that, you know, I fell in love at a very, uh, young gauge that you know that love of the, the feeling of going fast and the adrenaline you get of uh, you know going at high speeds um, that obviously f- for me came from from a very young age I'm sure it was the same for my brother um, but I never really felt uh, you know pressure from from the outsider forced to do this yeah. it's something that I, I've, I love to do and uh, it was always my dream yeah, there was never any um, like uh, outside pressure for us. I think it was for sure growing up when I was younger, before I even started, uh, you know, racing, I was going and watching Max at the Daytona 24 hours. I, I used to love that because both him and uh, Christian, my mom's cousin, were racing in the same series in the Daytona 24 hours. So I would go Daytona's in Florida. So I would drive up with like my mom or my dad go there and watch the race. And I loved it because you stayed in the motor home and the race, it's a 24 hour race. So you kind of, you know, do like a little camping uh, there and watch the whole race. And that's what kind of uh, gave me the feeling, Oh, let me try, you know, driving a, a cart and, you know, a go-kart. Um, but it, I was never any pressure to get into it. And I think the love for it kind of just came on over the years. But for me, like Enzo said, like he loves like the, the feeling of going fast. Like for me, yeah, I love the feeling of going fast, but um, I've always liked competition a lot. And I used to play uh, soccer. I used to play basketball. I, I used to, honestly, I like, uh, there was a point where I was in between basketball and racing. And then I realized, well, you didn't want to come this route, bro. I realized that I really was not good enough. <laughs> so then at a certain point, everybody started growing and I stayed around the same height yeah. and my physical and my t- like technical talent, my, my skills were not improving. I was like, bro, I better stick to racing. But for me, it was a competition aspect. I always, I love competing and like going into a race weekend. If I have a million problems going out, like in my personal life, as soon as I get into like a race weekend, I forget everything. It's unbelievable. And it was the same if I would go and play basketball or play soccer. You're so focused in the moment. So I think it's that feeling of competition. That's what I really fell in love with uh, in racing. Wow. Not that special. And I feel the same, you know, when it comes to basketball court. It's crazy. I actually just basically my hometown. I grew up playing on this court my whole life. Um, I just came back, you know, Malad, he was there. We renovated the whole court. It's called the Kennedy Court now. Um, That's I, amazing, man. They have a key to the city where I'm from. It's literally sitting right here on my windowsill. Um, was honored with the key to the city where I'm from. That's crazy. Wow, that's how, how was that feeling of 
seeing the court that you used to play in all the time renovated and it was the first moment I came out there with my family and saw it fully done there's like the checker court run your own race on the court I legitimately cried and it was like I can imagine I was I was was sad I was I was happy but it brought back a lot of the memories of the feelings I had when I would go to that court when I would come you know about my family problems or if I had you know stuff with school or basketball maybe I was getting overlooked and I just came to this court to just kind of just let everything wash away and so to see that work 10 years later 15 years later being in the NBA coming back to the city, having that court redone. I mean, to your point, I was never into racing. I actually like football, but once you, you go down that route to compete, to be the best version of yourself, I mean, that's something that I did and that was something it kind of manifested into. So, you know, I definitely relate to that, but I think you made the right choice. I think that's you made awesome, the right man. choice. <laughs> yeah, you made the right choice, Pietra. Oh yeah. I right, know you shouldn't. <laughs> I think I think I, I definitely made the right choice, yeah. bro. <laughs> I would have. Uh, I don't think I would have gone far in uh, in basketball. Uh, you, <laughs> now you so, were you would have been really well as like a as like a coach or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I used to like it. They they always used to put me on defense because I I used to be super aggressive and I hustled hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with all the other skills, at a certain point, I just wasn't good enough. But I've always been like, I, I, I've always hustled really hard. It's the same with racing. I always have, like, um, I like to work a lot. And I think in, like, when I play basketball, I used to, like, outrun everybody and stuff because I just, I don't know, it's, I get really competitive. Okay. <laughs> so you guys both mentioned, you know, things that you've, like, learned or what connects that passion and, and how that drives you. Any, any, like, lessons, insights, things that, like, maybe your family has, like, shared with you from, like, a plethora of people that you can ask that has like helped you like maybe harness that competition to become better at what you do or harness that feeling of wanting to go fast to become better at what you do or how you drive? I think, um, I, I think the most important thing is, is to enjoy it because it, it comes to a point where, uh, you know, you, you get to a really uh, high point, a very high, high competition. And sometimes, you know, at some point it's a lot of pressure um, and you forget to enjoy what you're doing and to think, well, wow, just being grateful of the opportunity you're having. Uh, like for me, just the opportunity of having to race in Formula 2 uh, is incredible. There's only 22 drivers uh, in the world right now racing in Formula 2, 20 drivers in Formula 1. And sometimes you forget to enjoy these moments because, you know, you're you're obviously you're, you're fighting for your career. And uh, but that for me is uh, what I always try and remind myself is enjoy every lap I do, every corner I do, uh, drive it like if it was my last time uh, driving the the car, you know, drive it like if it would be my last race uh, ever. So I always give it my my best and I try to enjoy every moment as much as possible. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Enzo. I think that's something that I maybe I, you know, I learned uh, throughout the years as well, because everything is so intense, you know, every season, it's kind of like, you need to do well to be able to earn another season. So you're always on this pressure of like, you make it or break it. So I think enjoying it is, um, or just, yeah, just being in the moment. I know it sounds very cliche, but I think it's, uh, it's very true because time goes by very fast. I felt like yesterday I just moved to England and then I was looking, it's like, it's been uh, 10 years now almost. It's like, Seriously, when I first came and 10 years has gone by and it's felt like, you know, I can remember the first week I was there. So um, the, the other thing I, I also learned is like, you know, I think it's a lot of people are like, uh, I remember like growing up, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, focus on racing, but always have a, a plan B just in case. Like, what are you going to do? Like, for sure, school is very important. I'm not saying like, don't focus on school or anything, but I'm saying like, at least for me, it was a lot of people were like, um, you know, yeah, I think it's great that you're doing racing, but make sure, you know, you have a plan B just in case. And for me, that's honestly, at least for me, that was bullshit. I think you have to have a plan A and only a plan A and either you make it or you don't. And that was kind of the mentality I went with is like, I only have racing and I'm going to do everything I can until I literally cannot do it anymore to make it happen. And then if it doesn't happen, then I'll find whatever else I want to do 
then that'll be the plan B. But I'm not going to have this backup plan just in case, because then you're, you you kind of go into it, not half committed, but you go into kind of feeling like you might fail. You have to go in with like, I don't care if I fail, I'm going to do everything I can. And I don't care if I come out with nothing at the end, but yeah. I know that I did everything I can. And I think that's something that I learned as well. Like, especially in the beginning, because I was the first one to go at least from our immediate family, like to Europe and stuff. And my family has always been super supportive. I remember like other people, even people like the teachers in the school and stuff, knowing I was moving to England for racing to like, yeah, but you know, you, you have to like, you know, be careful and make sure you're um, you know, you have a plan B. And I was like, I'm going to do everything I can. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Then I'll, I'll find something else. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to unpack that because I have a lot in my own journey, but also just in general, like, I, I, I read books, you know, on motivation. I read books on people who have been successful because success leaves clues. You know, you're not going to just go listen to anybody who hasn't done anything. You know, you're going to look at the greats. And one person I have, I, li- I literally have sitting here is Kobe, you know, and his mentality. And so we can pull a clip. We can, you know, go and look at, you know, one of his quotes. And he's like, you know, I go hundred percent in on everything. He said, I don't believe in, you know, putting your eggs in different baskets. All of my eggs are in this basket. You know, and so when it comes to, you know, what you guys are doing, when it comes to my journey, and I think everyone who's listening in whatever walk of life that it is, you know, it's, it's really not necessarily a, a mental thing where it's, if I don't succeed, then I'm a failure. It's, it's give yourself the opportunity to succeed by giving, putting everything you have into it. And so I think what you're saying is you, you took a leap of faith. You went about, you know, the journey that you wanted to go on. You knew the race that you were running at an early age and said, wherever that finish line ends up being, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a success to me just because I may or may not get to F1, F2 for that matter. I'm going all in. And you you found success through that. You've had adversity. You had the injury. You've had, and Malad can, can talk about it because it's one of his questions as he's watching Drive to Survive and he's looking at Haas. And I told him a little bit about your story. He's like, well, why isn't he in the, in the main seat, right? <laughs> And so, I mean, Malai, you can ask that question. We can dive into that because it's also something I want to know. Like, how do you continue to push towards that finish line, not knowing where it actually is, having all these eggs in one basket and you have an opportunity p- potentially in front of yourself. It may not go your way. You know, I mean, and this is this happens in the NBA. There's 450 spots and it feels like it's impossible to get one. You guys have 20 seats, 22 seats, you know, and so so. Let's talk about the, the the comparison and that the dynamics there. Yeah, definitely. Specifically with Pietro, um, not too long ago, your, your your team decided to bring somebody back when it was be, when you had an opportunity to take over that main driving seat, right? The team brought back Kevin. Kevin, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Magnuson is, is mm-hmm. the last one. And and you had a good quote. Um, you mentioned that you were disappointed but you knew that it was what the team needed. And you also said that it doesn't change your commitment and your story doesn't end here, which goes hand in hand with what Devin is talking about, right? What are, you know, what are, what was that experience like? You know, how did that fuel you? How did that lift you up? Very similar to like Devin's story, you know, he had had the opportunity to either fold or elevate, right? And you have the same opportunity now. Yeah, definitely. It was um, for sure when they made the decision, it was, you know, between me and him and, I understood the team's position away where they, they had a car where um, and the team was in a position where they, they hadn't performed in the past two seasons and they finally developed a good car and they needed an experienced guy that they kind of a known quantity that they've um, had before to go out there and and uh, and deliver. Obviously, um, I was disappointed because I knew from all the testing and the racing I've done with the team um, kind of what I would be able to deliver. And I I have no doubt that, that I would be able to. Um, But in any case, I could have looked at it in, in two ways. I could have looked at it negatively and been like, you know what, I'm done and I'm out or, you know, let's keep working. The opportunity is going to, is going to come. And that's kind of the way that, that I looked at it. Then the team gave me the chance to do the testing at the beginning of the year with the new car. Um, You know, there's possibilities of me driving again uh, towards the end of the season and uh, the thing is, like, it's the same mentality as I had. I have one goal, and the goal is, you know, to be racing in Formula One or even in IndyCar full time. Um, I, I've been with Haas for the past couple of seasons, and I had the situation where in 2020, I almost didn't go to the last three races with the team. 
um, because I was going to have some other commitments. And I said, you know what? I need to finish this off with the team. The team was going to allow me to go do my other testing and stuff in other seasons. I was like, I need to finish off what I have with the team. And I went to those last three. And I remember the day that like I was booking the, the flights and stuff with the team. I, I, I remember like really considering not going because I had these, these other options I could have done that wasn't in Formula One. And um, I went and that was the moment that I had the shot to race in Formula One because Grosjean had the accident and stuff. And I almost, I, I couldn't, like, I, I, I can't imagine how it would have felt if I went to yeah. the plan B or whatever. And then Grosjean yeah, had the accident, they put yeah. someone else in and I, I missed the opportunity. So it's kind of not a similar thing, but it's like, I'm going to run this full on. I had the, the contract with the team from the beginning of the year. Um, so we'll see, you know, where it goes uh, towards the end of the year. But I know where my, my, my commitment lies and um, where my goals lie. So um, we're doing everything we can to, you know, to be on the grid in Formula One. And uh, obviously the dream is to have both me and Enzo in, racing in Formula One. You know, to have the Fittipaldi brothers racing there. I think that's, uh, that would be, uh, yeah, man, that's the, the ultimate, ultimate goal. <laughs> yeah. you, guys are ahead of, you guys are ahead of us. I mean, we're trying to ask the questions. You're answering all the questions. You guys are killing it, man. Like, well, that's because you guys are just, you're, you're just in the moment. I, I can see it on Enzo's face. He's, he hasn't stopped smiling since we started. <laughs> Enzo never stops smiling, bro. He's <laughs> that's, his, that's his default <laughs> setting. Like, Enzo, let me see you just not smile. <laughs> I, I, no, you have to see difficult. him sometimes no. pissed after the race. Then Enzo's, a, Enzo's very heated. Mm. If you go into the truck and he ha- doesn't have a good race and you question him on something – then you definitely are going to get some uh, some cool. hard answers back. I uh, get stressed out. He's like a little pit bull. <laughs> they call him the little shark, but he's a little pit bull. That's it. <laughs> I love it. But Enzo, so, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're bringing up a part of your brother's past that's kind of like a, a stake in the ground, a turning point. You know, you, you've been on this steady ascension. You know, what's probably the most, a series of moments that probably caused the most amount of doubt that has maybe even caused uh, a sense of like not wanting to do this if that ever came up and how did you like push through that how did you overcome that internal adversity i think i never never in, uh, in my career i never had a i've never had a point where i said i don't want to do this anymore you know i never really uh, came to a point uh, there but I, i've had some very t- times uh, recently that were very uh, difficult in my career uh, when I was with Ferrari for four years um, and at the end of 2020 uh, you know we had lost our main sponsor um, and basically I I had to you know to continue racing in Europe uh, we had an option to go with uh, with the top team in Formula 3 but we just simply didn't uh, have the budget um, so I had to come to the United States um, in the road to, to India and I had to split ways with, uh, with Ferrari. Um, and basically my, my dream of making it, uh, for, from the road, basically going away from road to formula one, you know, um, which is all my ultimate dream is to make it to, uh, has always been to make it to formula one. So that for me was a really difficult time. And I, uh, you know, I kind of took a step back in my career. I went to race in, uh, in Indy pro. Um, and you know, the start of the season, uh, you know, I did the first race, um, then I, I was at St. Petersburg, uh, when there was having the, uh, race there. Um, you know, I had a really bad weekend there. We had also a really big crash. Uh, luckily I was okay. Um, but I remember after that race weekend, um, we basically, uh, you know, we really didn't have any. Uh, more budget to continue uh, maybe to do one or two more rounds of the Indy Pro and then not even to finish the the championship. And I remember that after that weekend, I was like, man, this is really, uh, you know, probably it. I don't know if I'll be able to to continue racing um, after this. And a few days after that race weekend, I get a call from uh, Charouz, uh, the team owner from, from Charouz, and they call me and say, "Hey, we we want to uh, we we need a, a good driver uh, to race in the in our car, and we we have a free we have a free ride uh, here for you." And 
it was like, wow, I didn't even think about it twice. And uh, next week, the week after, I was already racing in Barcelona in Formula 3. I had basically got all my bags and got the plane and went to Barcelona. Um, and that was the first race of the season. I was fighting for a win there uh, on my first race weekend. Had an accident, um, which was, you know, it's racing. But that was where, uh, you know, it went very, it was a difficult time. And then I had this opportunity come up out of nowhere and I took the most of it. I had the, I got the best result of the team in uh, Budapest, uh, which was a second place at the time, um, which is the best result in the team's history. And that result in Budapest is what got me, you know, the promotion, the opportunity to race uh, in Formula 2 uh, when I did my debut at Monza uh, in the last couple rounds of the F2 season from uh, last year. Wow. It's big time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you mentioned uh, sponsors. And, and here's one thing. It's like, as I'm still learning, and there's a lot I need to learn. At the same time, I feel like I know a lot more than than my peers around here. So when it's Sunday at 9 a.m. and they're like, what are you up to? And I'm like, I'm watching the race. They're like, what are you talking <laughs> about? So, and, and people are, are not catching up with what's going on. They're waiting for another season of Drive to Survive to come out so they can binge it. And I'm like, no, it's happening right here, right now. You know, so um, it's really cool because, again, since, since I was introduced to you guys at the Indy 500, um, kind of right back when, when COVID kind of ended, it was the first real, I think the largest in-person event since COVID hit, um, which was awesome to see you drive there, Pietro. Um, I feel like I've been learning a lot, but for my audience, um, who's, who's learning more as we continue to build the podcast, um, obviously we have two extremely special, young, talented, um, Formula One, Formula Two drivers here. So tell us about what is it like and, and what do you need to, like you said, rise and ascend in terms of budget? How you get these sponsors? Who are some of your top sponsors right now? Um, and just kind of talk through that process. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, beginning of the year, uh, we were able to sign with uh, Bank of Brazil, which was um, basically gave the, the chance and opportunity for Enzo to race a full season of Formula 2 beginning of this season. And um, what helped us a lot was throughout the pandemic and the quarantine um, all the racing stopped and you know all the sports events and everything so everything became uh, you know they were doing all the virtual races and things like that and then formula one started holding like the official virtual f1 championship instead of the real races because they had stopped it and uh, Haas had asked me and Enzo to race for them um, because the two drivers that they had uh, Roman and uh, Kevin they don't really use the sim so much so then they asked me and they asked Enzo and throughout that time, we said, oh, okay, let's let's run these virtual races, um, but let's set up a Twitch channel, whatever, like a YouTube channel, like, you know, document some of these things. And it started with nothing. And like over time, throughout the whole pandemic, it grew and we got a massive following. One of our very good friends now is the biggest Twitch streamer in Brazil. And there are a couple months in the year where he's the biggest Twitch streamer in the world. And when we were doing those virtual races, um, he was he would stream on top of our channel. So we Bring got like people over. Yeah. So we basically got a bunch of support from this uh, massive Twitch streamer, which uh, he's, he's a very good friend of ours. And that, you know, grew our Twitch and YouTube channel a lot. And then we became very active on this like digital segment. And that's what helped us a lot um, to get these new sponsors um, through the Twitch, through the YouTube channel. And it's, uh, you know, I don't think there's many drivers that do, honestly, and trying to say it humbly, but I don't, I really don't think that there are many drivers that do the amount of uh, work on the digital side as we do, because we know we depend on the sponsors to be able to race. We need the funding to move forward. And this is a way and a tool that we utilize to be able to um, get the sponsorships and, you know, increase budgets and stuff uh, to fund our racing. Uh, because yeah, the numbers are very big. You know, when you go from karting to F4 to F3, F2, F1, it's uh, the the budgets are big, so you need the funding behind. Mm. You have a team with you that do that does that, or is this for the Pauli brothers? You know, hand in hand, just going out and getting these deals done. Because it seems like you guys. I mean, your Twitch is, is crazy. The YouTube is crazy. TikTok is going wild. Uh, you guys are very active. You build a really good brand. And so again, like, I don't know many brothers in or sisters for that matter in any sport 
that are able to do what you're doing. So yeah, you said it humbly, but you guys are literally leading the way in this digital space. So it's super dope to see. It started with just uh, me and my brother and um, like all the content stuff, you know, we, we, we do it together. Um, but then yeah, slowly it's, it's been growing. Now we have uh, three people on our team with us, you know, that helped it. Like we have a YouTube uh, manager, you know, that edits the videos. Then we have a videographer that comes to our race weekend. So we have the, we're vlogging every race weekend with the videographer before it used to just be ourselves with the camera. And then we're, we were like, all right, the channel grew. We got to step it up a little bit. We can't keep the same. <laughs> yeah. So we have a videographer. He's a Brazilian guy and he comes with us. And sometimes like we don't have the, the money to like, <laughs> and I told the videographer, he's a, he's a friend of ours. And he's like, dude, I don't have the budget to like get an extra room like hotel room and stuff. So some of these race weekends, we'll just have to sleep in the same room. <laughs> like all three grind. of us. That's the grind. And that's beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> so we have like, we get like a twin bedroom and then you like someone sleeps on the sofa just to make it possible, you know? And it's like, that's how we've been growing. We're going, you know, growing our team slowly, but with, uh, with key people. And um, yeah, and we'll, we, we keep pushing. That's awesome. That's right. That's so great. We're in the same position now. We're doing the same exact thing. One one person at a time, one budget at a time. We figure it out. So <laughs> we funny. love hearing that. <laughs> it's so difficult, but it's it is definitely worth it. And the the it, it grows very slowly. It's just the consistency that's important. That's right. 100 percent You did talk, we you already kind of mentioned what the end goal is. So I think with that, we're we're getting a big picture of who the Fittipaldi brothers are, not just as a collective, but individually, you both have unique journeys. You know, it seems that Enzo has gotten the scraps from, from a young age and he's used those scraps and turned them into a very fast vehicle, very, you know, fast, strong tools as his own person to, to persevere and overcome things. So it's great that you Enzo have a brother like PHO to look up to and to lead the way and guide. And I feel like it's giving you all the access and resources to go and be the best. And we see that. Um, so you guys both, you know, work hand in hand doing so. Um, but, you know, individually, let's start with you, Enzo, and then we can kind of, you know, talk and tie it together as brothers and kind of your own entity that you're building. What do we see from, from you, Enzo, in the next two years? What can we as fans, your supporters, potential sponsors see from you in the next two years? I mean, from, from the next two years, it's uh... – you know, my, obviously it's pretty simple for me, <laughs> like getting his next two years. I know what, I know what the goal is. I know where I see you. No, I mean, the goal, <laughs> the goal is, uh, is obviously to be in, in uh, formula one, which is the, the pinnacle motorsport, And it's the, it's the dream. I think of, of every driver to, <clears throat> you know, to, to make it there. And, uh, uh, but you know, I'm, I think I'm in the, I'm in the right, um, let's say, I'm I'm going to to the right uh, path, you know, which is Formula Two, um, and yeah, to make it there, you have to perform. You're doing, uh, well. You're doing and great. yeah, we're doing really well. We're doing very well, and um, you know, my goal this year is still to to finish top three in the championship. We're we're very much in the fight uh, for the top three. I'm only uh, eight points behind Sargent, who's in third. Um, and that would be, you know, if we finish top three this year, that would be, uh, you know, insane. That would be amazing because I think that would be, you know, also the the best result of the team in its in its history. Um, and yeah, that would just to finish top, you know, to just be fighting for top three on my first season in in Formula Two uh, is already a big, uh, you know, a big achievement. So. Yeah, just, you know, in the next two years, I really uh, don't know. I think, um, uh, you know. No, where do you see yourself? You where do I say it? You got to say it. You no, can't well, be scared to no. say it. This, this, isn't, this isn't the classic camera in your face. Oh, I got to uh, get No, bro, come on. What are you doing in two years? Yeah, oh, I see. You You're know, still going to be figuring it. out the answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, yeah, I see myself. I see myself in Formula One. Yeah. There, yeah, that's it. That's, that's, that's what we want to do. <laughs> I mean, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of road ahead to. There is, there is a every lot. Day, every day is gonna be a journey, man. Every day is right. it's, it's, it's non guaranteed. You don't know what tomorrow brings, but you have to have that vision. You have to speak it with confidence. I mean, this is a group right here. Everyone who's listening, whether they, man, Enzo's not gonna make it. Whether they believe you, it doesn't matter. 
But if you believe it, you speak it, and you put the work in, it's gonna happen, bro. That's right. That's the that's the that's the goal. That's my dream since I've been a little kid, and that's where I see myself in the next two years. Awesome. What about you, big bro? So for me, in the next two years or within the next year, you know, um, as humble as possible, I you know I I see myself racing in Formula One alongside my my brother. I think um, that has to be the goal. That has to be the dream. And uh, we're going to do everything possible to, to make it happen. I love it. Straight to the point. That's it. <laughs> How <laughs> straight to the point. We're going to see it. That's going to be great. I mean, I'm going to just be here getting better at the video game. Hopefully I'll be on the same. Wait, but what's, what's your, where do you see yourself? Yeah, in where two do years? you see yourself in two years? Yeah, Milad, where do you see yourself in two years? Yeah, no, 100%. Well, m- making sure that Run Your Own Race is still going on the pod. We're hopefully on episode like, a hundred in two years. Two years. That's what two years. <laughs> the Radio Race will have grown into its into its own media company where we can tell stories about uh, people from all walks of life. Um, you know, we can we can shed light on everyone's journey. Um, you know, really tell these stories, tell it in a creative way, uh, create a much larger audience that that just motivates, inspires people to live their best life. That's what the brand is. That's what the company is. That's what it's going to grow into. Uh, it's going to make make the world a better place, uh, spread a lot of light and joy and love out into the world um, and hopefully inspire people to just believe in themselves, you know, not not have make plan B, C's and D's, um, but to go all in on their plan A and and whether they succeed in the way that they thought they would. Um, either way, they won't see their journey as a failure because plan B will take care of itself. Once you go all in on plan A, it'll just naturally appear and it's going to be way better than any plan B you could have made in the first place. Right. So that's going to bring it full circle. And then for me, actually, I have all my goals written on a whiteboard right here. Legend. Um, (laughs) I can't, I can't share all of them, but I will say that in two years, within two years, I'll have won an NBA three point contest. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Let's go. (laughs) I've helped lead my team to the playoffs. And then, you know, within the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot of special things that happen. So we'll stay tuned, man. We'll stay tuned. We, we have That's a, very cool to hear you put it on the wall. I, I, I do something very similar. Yeah. What do you do? No, I, basically, when I, when I was training at the gym at home, um, for example, when I was racing the Indy 500 last year, or the, the oval races I was doing, I'd had the picture of every trophy from every race that I was going to race in at the wall where I use in the gym, you know? So it's something similar, but it's a, uh, I yeah. see it. It's something you see every day, you know, I'd be using the gym, in the garage every day. So I'd see it, that trophy. That's the goal. That's what I'm going to get. You got to envision it. So it's. Yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of power in it. I think there's a lot of power in writing things down. Everything we said, hopefully is written down somewhere. It's written down here. It's written down 10 other places. And, it just constantly like reinforce it in your brain. When you go to the gym and I'm shooting, even if I miss 10 in a row, which I literally probably did today at some point, I missed 10 in a row. A lot of guys, now they're in their head, man, questioning themselves. Can I shoot? Am I good? What's wrong? Nope. I'm literally the best shooter in the world. Next shot's going in. Next shot's going in. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. When I, when I was right. fighting the championship in 2017, beginning of the season, I lost a lot of wins because I was – I was starting really bad. I had an issue with my, with my clutch release. And, um, and then I was working with this coach and basically he made me put on the wall. I am the best race starter in the world. And I had that from middle of the season onwards and for what it took a while, but I, I did, it did flip. I became a lot better, but it's literally the same uh, exercise that you do. It's yeah. crazy. And awesome. I, Devin, how many hours did you train today? Uh, so we had yoga this morning. We did yoga from 10 to 11. And then we had shooting from one from noon, from noon to one or one to two. And then we're actually about to go, literally leave in like 30 minutes uh, to go to a Orlando City soccer game, MLS. Okay. Uh, and then I'll be back in the gym tonight from eight to nine. And today's a light day. Today's an off day. <laughs> oh, you're going to go watch the MLS. I, so I was, I was at Charlotte. I was watching the Charlotte FC. Okay play against uh washington uh yeah dc united and dude it was such a cool experience i had so much fun then you're gonna orlando city just won like the an in-season tournament 
It was like some sort of open cup. They did the, the U.S. Open Cup. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so okay. Big time for them. And so we're about to go and and show them some love here soon. But that's cool. I appreciate you guys, man. This was a uh, this was great getting to know you guys a little bit better. Um, obviously, you know, sharing your stories, which are both special, unique in their own way. Um, and my my group, we're excited. Everyone who's listening, I'm sure can have some strong takeaways and and follow your guys' journey. So thank you both for being on. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Milad. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for, for having us on here. It was really a pleasure and uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, guys, I really appreciate it. It was awesome. I think um, let's have more in the future and uh, I'm sure in a couple of years, we're going to be looking back at this and uh, see that we've accomplished our goals. So yeah, we have know. to do another one in like two, like yeah, two like a year. Yeah. From now and- <laughs> All right, it's done. The lot is gonna have the biggest podcast. Last, last, last question. Actually, last question. This may make the bonus reels. So you're both driving F1. Would it be on the same team? Would it be on different teams? And then also talk about what it would be like racing. It was Hamilton's, the Max Verstappen's, the world, Charles Leclerc, like all these guys. Everyone here in America, like they just follow the top people. But tell me what it would be like racing with or against them, with or against each other. Uh, because for me, it's like this season going up against Steph Curry, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, you know, like these are the same type of uh, stature of people that are racing in your world. So what would that be like? Yeah, I mean, for me, like I had that experience in 2020 and it was just uh, it was surreal. I was actually for a long time in my first race uh, racing uh, with Kimi Raikkonen, who's a Formula One world champion. And he was in Alfa Romeo. So it was a similar level car as Haas and stuff at the time. And um, just racing hard with him for like, I I swear, like a straight 45 minutes on track. And I remember thinking like, he was in front of me at the time and his like car was like sliding. I'm like, you know, I'm racing with Kimi Raikkonen over here. (laughs) Look at this guy getting the car sideways. Like, what do you think he is, a world champion? (laughs) But it's, uh, it's cool. But then at the time, you have to think like, you can't let, I remember being kind of starstruck but when you're out there you can't let that kind of elude you in a way like all oh, these guys are bro i made it here as well you know it's like i respect their titles and everything but i'm here to race you just as hard as i'd be racing anybody else yeah. and i think you have to have that mentality if not you always kind of see them as higher than you or you know more so you have to like i respect everything they've done i'm gonna race them you know hard and respect them but i'm gonna race them really hard just as i would race anybody else yeah and the same with Enzo. If I'm yeah. racing him, I'm going to race you hard, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no, doesn't matter. Once you're on track, there's no there's no friends. doesn't matter if Pietro's my brother. Uh, no, but I think we would do some team. Even in separate teams, we would. We would what? We would teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll be, oh, but I think in Formula One, it would be so. you have so many things going on that you just wouldn't be able to, to really do it. You would just do your own race. Like if I was going for my first win, you were in second. Your teammates in third with newer tires. Would you block him to avoid, like get me? <laughs> let me get my first win or what? Wait a second. You want me to get fired now? Yeah. Yeah. We'll just have to look and see. Oh, cool, man. Thank you so much for having us. It was awesome. Thanks, no, guys. We appreciate you guys. Cue the outro music. <laughs> <laughs>